One of the best things about Payday 2 is how spoiled for choice you are in terms of weapon variety. There are literally hundreds to choose from, and that list gets longer with every update. But what if all that choice was taken away, leaving you with only the most basic and underpowered of weapons from your arsenal? In other words, can you beat Payday 2 with just the sludge of the starting guns? As ever, with a challenge video such as this one, I like to explain the entire rule set before diving into the video proper. Also, you might think beating the game with some weapons is surely easier than beating it with none at all, as you tried in the last video. You'd be right, for the most part. I actually wanted to try a challenge that was a little more winnable after the travesty of Panic Room last time around. And I really thought it would be. How bad could these guns really get? I also chose this rule set in particular as the game's just gone on a massive sale, so we have an influx of new players having to suffer through the god-awful Amcart once again. And I wanted a taste of that suffering, and to maybe show new players it can be done. But now I'm recording this section after the rest of the script, I can tell you it gets pretty bad, so don't take anything for granted in this run. Just to explain why this even is a challenge at all, the two weapons I'll be solely using today are the Amcar and the Shimano 88, classics of the franchise, but really better off staying in Payday the Heist. The Amcar belongs to the Assault Rifle category of weapon, which is already considered one of the weakest in the game, and within that category, it is pretty objectively the worst. It has the lowest DPS out of all of them, a tiny base mag size, and it has pretty torrid accuracy, the second most important stat in my opinion. The only features it's got going for it are a solid base stability stat, access to some decent attachments, and passable ammo economy. I can't really think of an assault rifle, or saying that, any weapon that I'd rather use less than the Amcar. Its baby brother, filling our secondary slot, is the Chimano 88, a pistol which is made to look good because the Amcar is so bad. This thing still has no stopping power, but at least it isn't notably terrible, actually outperforming things like the group occurs. Even though it won't be winning any awards in standard play, it's definitely going to be my MVP as we get later into the game. One saving grace both weapons have are their workable concealment stats, meaning we can reach base detection risk and pull off stealth ice easily enough. As a result of that, I will often be rushing through stealth ice completions in this video unless something particularly interesting takes place. That said, let's get on to the rules of this challenge. As with the previous video, there are a bunch of rules in place aiming to make this a genuinely difficult challenge, as the Payday Career Mode is pretty easy on the surface. Also, notice I call it Career Mode now. Yeah, the Story Mode run in the No Shooting Challenge is now Vintage, as the mode has been renamed and had some tweaks for accessibility. First things first, what are the core stipulations which make this run unique? Number one, that we must not purchase any weapons in the primary or secondary slot. That means it won't be possible to bring anything other than the starting unlocks, the Amcar and the Shimano along on heist with us. I am however able to spend money on attachments for these weapons, making silence fair game and meaning I don't have to do pacifist stealth attempts. That's because the second core rule is that we cannot kill enemy units with anything other than these two starting weapons. This rule is in place to prevent me from leaning on equipment strats, or simply copying the powerful melee build from the last video and hardly ever using the weapons that make this challenging. These limitations do not include vehicles and exploding barrels, as those would be a nightmare to avoid on certain heights. Jokers are a bit of a grey area for this challenge, I know some of you didn't like me using them in the no shooting run, but trust me, they felt very necessary. Here, I plan to resist jokers for as long as possible, but we'll fall back to them if I feel they're necessary to proceed. As for the other rules, many of them will look identical to the last video. My Yale Wonk account is freshly reset to Infamy Zero level 0, I play only in the offline mode with no online assistance permitted, all cash and experience must be earned within the main storyline missions, additionally AI crew members are not allowed in general outside of stealth ice or under one exception I'll get to in a second. Again, no mods will be used outside of Wolfhood, link to that in the description, mine's still broken but I'm sure I'll get around to fixing it one day. I'll also be following the same difficulty rules as last time, with suggested difficulties being far too easy to constitute a challenge, it'll be mayhem, up to 80, at which point Death Wish becomes available for purchase and will be the chosen difficulty. There's one extra rule I'm throwing into the mix this time though. Many of you seem to be disappointed that I was forced to give up after hitting the brick wall of Panic Room. In this challenge, I'm going to trial a new lifeline system, a little bit like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? These lifelines consist of drop difficulty and crew support. I honestly wanted three to be thematic, but couldn't think of an acceptable third. 
Simply put, these are single use tokens I can spend in order to make brick wall heists a little more doable. Drop difficulty lets me heist on the next lowest difficulty, and crew support lets me bring along the crew AI to assist me, of course rightly equipped with their own crappy AM cars. I'm hoping this makes decisions throughout the playthrough a little more dynamic and gives me options even if the heist looks impossible on the surface, making it so you guys get even more content. Of course, I'm just trialing the system so it can change or even disappear for future runs based on your feedback. In the meantime, let's get into the challenge. So once again, Yell Wonk returns, fresh off the back of disappointment and ready to get some revenge, especially on those damn snipers. This time around, I'll be approaching the initial assignment slightly differently. Instead of doing the loud tutorial, I'll be following the other line which involves simply getting to level 10. I seem to have continental coins still after resetting, which probably has something to do with permanently completed challenges, but in any case, I intentionally waste them on useless scopes, so this is a clean restart. To actually hit level 10 with no perks or skills, and with Mayhem as the prescribed difficulty, I was going to need a decent enough stealth mission to pop up. Things like Diamond Store or Car Shop were on my radar. Eventually, using the same online filter technique as last time around, a car shop hit shows up, which I knew would be doable even at this early stage. Now, here comes my first mistake of many. I forgot that the budget suppressor is available to you from the get-go, so I enter this heist with two unsilenced weapons, meaning I was going to have to pacifist this car shop. Absolutely doable, but still a pretty rough oversight on my part, with the keycard objective presenting a real challenge. This could have easily been overcome by a little better planning on my part, which really is my downfall across this run, as you'll soon find out. After a few unfortunate RNG setups, I learned I could melee security once in order to dominate them, which didn't break any rules and gave me at least a few options. But terrible convert pathing, and one kind of embarrassing hack failure later, Yelwonk was no closer to that coveted level 10. The run, which was eventually successful, was blessed by one of the best manager spawns and some pretty short-sighted cops, seeing me flee the scene in a Falcagini without firing a shot, unintentionally this time. The main thinking behind this start is to grant me a slight advantage in terms of grabbing early skills and perk points, going all the way to level 23 instead of only 10. This allows me to pick up one perk in Hacker for those early stealth ice, as well as some basic stealth and utility skills. I even received the throwback skin for the Amcar after this first heist. Clearly, it was a sign blessing this run. Alongside this, I use what cash I have over to purchase the available weapon attachments to silence both weapons and raise their concealment stats. When all said and done, my detection risk is already as low as 9, so stealth heist really shouldn't cause too many problems, making the early game a breeze. The getting ready assignment is a freebie, so now it's time to get back to heisting. Bank Heist Random is the first on my hit list to pop up on CrimeNet, so I head on in. Apparently, as of the career mode update, you can now choose the heist difficulty, so I didn't even need to suffer through this waiting time, but oh uh, well, for all time's sake, I'll do it anyway. On this run, I've decided not to spare the sieves if I don't have to, as I've already had enough of that pacifist life last time around, and I'm not risking my time for a bunch of pixels on screen. That makes for an easy stealth completion, and with this extra cash in the bank, I can afford a jewelry store contract and not through that easily enough too. It's at this point my progress is halted. Apparently, I haven't completed the bank heist, which is odd as I'm pretty sure that one earlier checked all of the boxes. Clearly, the career mode isn't working quite as intended at the moment. To avoid an extra experience dump, I head back into a normal bank heist via the career page, so it actually works this time. I'm pretty sure the extra 12k made zero difference as to the outcome of this run. With it working this time around, it's time to move on to the diamond store. As I mentioned, this is one of the very easiest early game heist on offer, so true to form I get spotted by Mikhail Nurmok through the glass on my first run. After a little incident with a pair of twins in the alleyway on run number 2, I make it through the bag moving simulator easily enough at the second time of asking. Unfortunately, it's Go Bank up next, the solo nightmare. As you know, I hate stealthing it, especially with constraints, so I put together a very basic build with low blow for crits and uppers for survivability and take it on. This being my first loud attempt of the run, it was also time to spend those perk points I'd been saving up. My initial thought was that I wanted something that could maintain low detection risk crits without relying on the RNG of dodge. 
Anarchist made perfect sense to me, especially seeing as it's also my favourite perk deck and playstyle in the game. In hindsight, this was a truly terrible choice, which I wouldn't find out until much later on. Foreshadowing aside, I had enough perk points for 3 cards worth, meaning we have extra armour at the cost of health, 2 seconds of damage immunity, and the regen over time effect already active. This was sadly not enough. Even though I could fend off standard cops a lot easier, groups and specials prevented even more of a challenge than during the melee run. I had no answer to shields, and even though I could now shoot the snipers, half the time they were simply too far away for these inaccurate pea shooters to land a shot. After three failed attempts to even get the cage assembled, and with the world's slowest lock picking session, I realised this was still the wrong strategy. As much as I hate to admit it, stealth really is the way to go at this stage. After a couple of soft attempts, I backed out to switch over to my stealth build and try again. Being willing to shoot service made this a whole lot easier than last time, although I did misplace the second keycard for a while. This time around, I didn't get so lucky with Gensec. They showed up after 10 minutes to put a spanner in the works, and instead of trying to deal with their pages like a human being, I instead chose to race them. The extra interaction speed, thanks to the crew AI here, made a huge difference, finding cash in deposit box number 3, slipping back through the lasers and making a break for it. Funnily enough, just as on the no shooting run, I made it to the escape vehicle as it drove off to go loud, meaning I made it out with milliseconds to spare. One of the few stealth heists on this run that's really worth talking about. With one of my bogey heists out the way though, it was time for some armoured transport hits. Train heist is up first. This one is always a monumental pain in terms of time consumption. One slip up and there goes 20 minutes. At least this member of the security team saw the funny side of things. This time I tried to approach things a little more aggressively, using up pages intentionally to create low traffic areas where I could move around without worrying about the 23 bags being spotted. As ever, I like to cut things nice and close at the end, so I decided to get spotted with no pages left, but still managed to get the last two ammo bags in before making it out thanks to ECMs. This gave me a much needed injection of XP to take on these upcoming mandatory loud heists. I decided to lean on a shotproof and feign death a lot earlier on this run and headed into transport crossroads. I assumed snipers wouldn't be such an issue this time around, but boy was I wrong. Without the ability to bring along damaging equipment like C4 or purchase a saw, everything on this heist felt so sluggish. After being halted at the drilling stage four times in a row, I decided to make a change. Pistol skills were the call to make use of the actually not totally useless Chimano 88. I also switched over to the park, as it's just an easier, more controllable setup in my opinion. After painstakingly taking 15 seconds to lockpick each deposit box, I finally had the cash needed to make my escape. I seriously don't know why I didn't have Die Hard equipped at this stage, but this is something I'll be leveraging later on. The only reason this was even doable without it was because the cops seemed to have a really tough time actually finding a way to hit you inside the transport vehicles themselves. But bad AI pathing saves the day once again, and I'm out. Except the off-forgotten escape mechanic decided to waste another 5 minutes of my time. It's so easy to forget these even exist. I think it's such a shame that Overkill didn't develop the early escapes into their own worthwhile random events. They feel like they exist to punish you, which is sort of thematic I guess, but if they were instead full of the possibility for extra loot or original heist objectives, I think they would have had a better reception and not ended up being so forgettable. Anyway, this is a challenge run, not a video essay, so let's go hit another armoured van. First though, I used some of those extra continental coins I'd earned to purchase key attachments, with the extended mag for the Chimano standing out as a must buy. My goal was to eventually get as much accuracy out of these things as possible. Just for a change, I went with Transport Harbour next. Surprisingly, this one was a lot easier than the crossroads, owing to the decent cover around the van placements themselves. There was one brilliant moment in this heist where a random elite SWAT took it upon himself to save the entire heist by diving in front of a taser about a second before I was guaranteed dead. What a legend. I literally didn't see him again either because he ran straight past so I can only assume he really was a secret inside man. Thanks to the real hero of this heist, I made it out at the first time of asking. As I'd hit level 25 hours ago, it was now time for some crazy Vlad heists. More Crasher first, an easy one that I breeze through, assuming we ignore this down right next to the escape. 
Honestly, having the first aid kit revives makes sense when you don't have another way to get back up, but there's no synergy there with FAKs and Anarchist. So yes, this setup really could go down on Mayhem. This is starting to make the no shooting run look like a breeze. On the third attempt through, I finally made it and on to four stores. I noticed I was breaking my own rules with modded lock joining the squad and ruining my immersion, so I punished myself by forgetting how to play the game. Apparently, shouting at a woman on the floor through a glass window with a weapon drawn is suspicious. <sighs> People these days. I finally made it out on the second time of asking and moved on from this whole affair. The Ukrainian job jewelry store was my next destination, a real breeze of a heist, and White Christmas didn't offer much resistance outside of a green dozer hiding in the bushes. An easy clear second time around. With six perks down in Anarchist, I was getting there, but the suit was not offering the armigating potential I was used to, and armigating is a lot less useful when you're only taking relatively small amounts of consistent damage. Death by a thousand cuts is a nightmare for Anarchist, and that was what I was experiencing. There was something brewing on the horizon, and absolutely no one is going to like it. If you can guess how I deal with this sticky situation, please comment now what old classic I pull out to save the day. Anyway, Meltdown was up next, always a tricky heist. Snipers were the issue when I couldn't shoot, but with these weapons, shooting often didn't make any difference. In fact, it was starting to become a disadvantage. By contesting the snipers, I was just holding myself in their line of sight for longer, a fatal mistake on more than one occasion. Not to mention my driving, or at least the geometry, was not helping. After finding myself sprawling on the floor on 11 separate occasions, often as a result of an early dozer onslaught or a sniper outside of the Amcar's 10 meter effective range, it was time to counter. A change of build was in order. Yep, that is Iron Man. This is ICTV Anarchist, a build I've received some serious flack for using in the past. I want to be clear with you, I am a convert. Suit Anarchist is infinitely better for DSOD and gives you a lot more build freedom. But it has one serious weakness, that being snipers, and this was my greatest mistake. Anarchist makes some sense on paper for this challenge run. It's a very strong and survivable deck, but snipers are its kryptonite and going down to them really isn't an option here. But the monstrous armor value of ICTV Anarchist laughs in the face of Mayhem Snipers. Yes, it takes 10 seconds per armor recharge, but with Bullseye Aced and Die Hard, I can top myself off, and so long as I'm interacting with something, virtually tank up all incoming damage on Mayhem. DSOD may turn it into Swiss cheese more often than not, but the ICTV version still has a place on a run such as this at lower difficulties. It's a shame, because at this point I would have preferred to be leveling Stoic for that moved death wish later on, but we'll make the OG build work. In fact, I'm immediately rewarded on Meltdown, as face tanking snipers is now an option, and with Frenzy and Berserker I can still dish out enough damage to stay relevant without the crits. I also follow a slightly different strategy here, moving all 8 of the warheads to the Longfellow's location before moving the first 4 to the train. This helps me time assaults a little better, and finally make it out with the nukes. ICTV Anarchist is vindicated, and it's going to be my go-to on this run from now on whenever snipers are involved. After Shock offers exactly that, and rather embarrassingly, my first attempt is ended by the very thing I've just tried to counter. Run number 2 goes a lot better, and I noticed during the holdout portion of the heist, playing solo without jokers is damn intense. I'm having a blast with this challenge, and with my newly acquired Iron Man suit, it really does feel like I'm holding off waves of aggressive cops by standing my ground. I love it. Shock and Ore Aced is also really helping against shields, which otherwise seriously jam up these crappy weapons. Aftershock was an easy completion in the end, so it's on to Stealing Christmas, another heist with the promise of snipers to further vindicate my move to the most mediocre build of 2020. This was an easy takedown, and I finally feel a little more in control of things. With that, I also get my stealth build down to 4 detection risk and take on Nightclub. Not really one worth dwelling on, a simple clear and completion. At this point, I finally bite the bullet and put some sights on my Amcar. Not that that's going to make it shoot any straighter. It's Watchdogs up next, and Hector's heist really didn't inspire me last time, but the way this build is playing, a basic hold down the objective style of mission can be a lot of fun. 
My first run looked fine, even if the slow movement speed of the ICTV was making me sluggish over ground. So sluggish in fact, I took a tumble down the catwalk. I recovered from that embarrassment with a better performance on my next run through, before embarking on day 2 and getting the full force of a taser beatdown this time. That reminded me that I needed shotproof back as soon as possible. I really couldn't rely on the 20 mag Amcar to free me manually. The second run was over and done in 6 minutes though, bringing me on to Firestarter. And I learned nothing from watchdogs. Again, I picked myself back up and made it through a laboured day 1, blasted through day 2 swiftly and again went loud for day 3. I'd already spent way too long waiting for drills on Bank Heist, might as well actually have something to shoot this time around. Rats is Hector's final mission, and this one actually gave me a tiny bit of trouble with a double shotgun combo ending the first attempt. Day 1 works really well in this format, it actually feels like how Holdout is meant to, you know, a wave survival mode with a fair bit of intensity. I get it done second time of asking, and the final two days are a formality. I simply pick up the intel from the gangsters and flee the Mendoza bus with a single loot bag in tow. That's where I decided to leave it for day one of recording, heading to bed with Big Oil as my next mission. The following morning, I woke up fresh faced and ready to steal some renewable energy technology that could possibly alter the environmentally self destructive path the world was hellbent on. Yeah, the payday gang kinda suck. And that's when it hit me. My career mode had reset. Turning the game off seemed to have broken something, as my character progress was all still there, but I was back on the basics. I went through a fair few emotions, decided to tweet the payday Twitter man, who calmed me by saying he'd get someone to look into it, and considered my options from here. At the end of the day, the career mode was always just what I was following, and it wasn't like I needed the rewards for completion. It kind of sucked that I wouldn't have anything to track my progress, but I wasn't about to spend another 7 or 8 hours playing through without recording, so I decided to forge onwards, just following the storyline from the wiki. No continental coins, but I already had basically every weapon attachment I'd need at this point in the game anyway. So onwards and upwards, career mode or not. Back to ruining the environmental future of planet Earth, Big Old Day 1 is still really easy when you have ECM jammers to carry you through it, and again, I went for the tried and true Day 2 stealth and high technique. As always, we use the trusty Big Oil solver to pick out an engine and find a nice comfy hole in which to hide in the forest. This time around I had the aid of Hacker and ECM feedback to actually do a decent job of leading the pursuing cops on a wild goose chase and made it out cleanly. I really like Big Oil these days, I used to think it was a bloated mess. Still, no career mode, so you'll have to trust me on what's next. Of course, we're still on the elephant's heist, so it's framing frame. This is a big 3 day stealth fest, and with minimum detection risk at this point, not a huge worry. I made it out with most of the paintings on art gallery, day 2 is a non event, and actually, for the first time in my heisting career, I managed to tackle day 3 cleanly at first time of asking. It's amazing what a little patience can do for you. Hopefully I can carry that over to election day. Using speed strats to get through day 1 with no fuss, and then day 2 is one I've played many times for the sake of its generous stealth bonus at the end. That doesn't stop me from failing attempt number 1, but my second crack of the whip goes a lot better, hardly having to leave the right side of the warehouse and making it out in just over 5 minutes. By now, I have the spare skills to add basic shot proof to the build, which is honestly enough seeing as we actually have a ranged option this time. The dentist heists are next on the chopping block, with Big Bank actually being an easier loud heist in my opinion than in stealth. A bit of a bloodbath, but at this point I feel pretty much untouchable on Mayhem. Although Death Wish loomed as I reached level 76 after this one. Onwards with Hotline Miami next, another great holdout style heist, which I really looked forward to without there being any AI to get in the way of my fun. Day 1 felt a little bit slow for my liking, and for once the snipers were actually in range of my weapons, so it didn't really give me much grief. Day 2 on the other hand really made me eat my words on the uh, untouchable front. Isma Dozers can still definitely do me a mischief. Attempt 2 was tased to death after less than 3 minutes, and then a sniper joined in to create the specials trifecta and finish off run 3. Not great, but fortunately all deaths that were within my power to avoid, which is always better than feeling like you can't do anything about it to be honest. On the 4th time through I was determined to play a little more carefully. The sheer quantity of spawn volume and persistent sniper presence on this map, all focused in on only me, actually did make it fairly difficult. 
Another noticeable struggle for this challenge build is in its weakness against high health special enemy types. On the no shooting challenge, I could build up a bloodlust swing or even just use throwing knives to easily take down high health targets. Here, outside of crits, which don't really mesh with ICTV, my DPS is incredibly limited, and it's that which leaves me feeling a lot weaker than I expected to by this point in the run. Just look at how long it takes to deal with the Commissar compared to the last video. But even so, this was another more difficult heist out of the way. I think it would have offered a serious challenge had I already been at the Death Wish stage of the run. Austin Breakout was next. Day 1 is an easy romp through the DC streets until we hit a wall of 20 second lot picking, which just serves to slow things down, especially now I have the diehard ICTV combo on lock. Day 2 is much of the same really, the closest you're going to get to being downed is actually at the start with the ludicrously overpowered FBI cops. With the reduced spawns of single player, it's actually very easy to play through a heist like Hoxton Breakout, which doesn't have very concentrated spawn logic. Just like last time, this was a simple first timer, but it rewards you with heavy experience. Meaning once again, I've made it to phase two of the run. We're on Death Wish now. Not much is changing on the stealth front, but there's gonna be some serious issues on Loud Heist to come. Fortunately, Hotstone Revenge lets us dip our toes in with stealth being the far better option. This one went fine, even though I have no idea what that guard spotted to ruin attempt one. Number 2 went far better, taking down Hector in the basement vault, the least likely character to return in Payday 3, and making it out with the 6 pieces of evidence. It's notable that the new starting strat has led to reaching level 80 marginally earlier than on the last run, hence why we unlock the Death Wish achievement. The Diamond, up next, if anything is an even easier stealth heist, and was a first time completion aided by the old pause the game and write down the pattern single player technique. The Dentist is very generous and keeps on offering Stealth Ice, which are a welcome sight at this point as they grant me much needed perk and skill points before the real challenge continues. Golden Green Casino is another heist that I've really grown into playing for this series in particular, and outside of a close encounter with this clown, it's an easy enough stealth completion for me now I've got the pattern of objectives down. With the Dentist sadly off to plot world domination, it's the Butch's heist up next. The Bomb Dockyard or Forest are my two options. Dockyard obviously makes the most sense when my builds are allergic to snipers, and I always remember having a great time with it in the past. I want to get this straight though. I love the Butcher, Mira did an incredible job, but her heists do my head in. I am ashamed of the number of restarts it took me to get this relatively simple heist done. Most of the time it was caused by me rushing or just being generally negligent, and I think the overall two story map design is quite cool and unique. But objectives like find the two keycards, are simply the worst in the game. They give you nothing to go on, they're basically saying, search the massive map idiot, which is where my patience wears thin and I start taking gratuitous risks. Unless you know all keycard spawn points, this heist a pain, and whilst I do, I still think it's pretty terrible design. It's not as if there's any puzzle logic to it really, it's just a case of luck on the desk. I can see why Overkill have started marking objectives when they're not found for a while. Anyway, rant over, I suck at the bomb dockyard, all of these failures were completely my own fault, but still, objectives like find X are bad unless X's location is generally hinted at or intentionally set out as a puzzle. I get it done in the end though, through gritted teeth, but I'm not sure I ever get over it, because I then proceed onto Scarface Mansion with that same gung-ho attitude. This can work as the guards outside the mansion don't have pages and so can be cleared completely, which is sort of unheard of for payday stealth. But with that in mind, I went in with low blow on my stealth build, thinking if I do get into a gunfight and need to kill the guards before they can shoot, this will absolutely help out. Which it does, sort of. So let me explain the mechanic to you I was previously unaware of. As most of you will know, any undetected shot on a guard will be a one hit kill no matter the weapon's damage per shot. However, that excludes special damage, i.e. critical hit damage. That's generally not an issue, seeing as most crits were one-shot cops regardless. But these weapons are so weak that if that first shot rolls the 30% chance to crit, they will fail to one-shot the guard, potentially giving them the chance to retaliate, or simply increasing the likelihood of someone else on the map spotting their alerted status. At first, I thought this was a bug or that the Amcar was simply so weak it didn't make it to the one-shot kill threshold, even in stealth. But nah, I did this entirely to myself, and had no idea it was the case. But hey, 
the more you know. That meant after dozens of failed stealth attempts, often disrupted by my own inability to kill stealthily, I finally backed out and changed my build to make things work as usual once again. I'm really not sure that the whole crit thing isn't intended, but who knows with Payday 2. With my own weapons no longer tripping over themselves, I was easily able to get inside the mansion, kill Ernesto, and with the courtyard clear, escape with all the loot. Honestly, I only bothered to do this because I was pissed at the heist. Was it worth my time? No, not at all. Speaking of wasted time, after all this, it was 20 levels of crime spree next. Up first, I rolled a nice easy cook-off for 13 levels in about 13 minutes, and then 4 floors for 8 more. I have to touch on this 4 floors run though. It's obviously only on overkill difficulty, but I couldn't have possibly foreseen this happening. Absolute Dozer Beatdown. This is how I imagine new players feel facing Dozers with the pea shooter that is the Amcar. It seriously humbled me. For those of you struggling here with what exactly happened, the Dozer charged me and meleeed me, which has a serious knockback on it, and in this case, launched me straight into a C4 rig door, one-shotting me instantly. If I didn't have those 15 continental coins required to rebuy this spree, this could have seriously set me back. Fortunately, I was able to get back in, and this one in a million occurrence did not take place again. Seriously, this was my favourite death ever in Payday 2. Everything about it looks so deliberate from the dozer. He's joining the ranks of the taser blocker from the harbour as the MVPs of this run, at least content-wise. Moving on, it was time for some real Amcar death wish experience. Counterfeit was up first, my choice over the Alesso heist. And it seems I've lost a chunk of that footage. I've also lost First World Bank and Murky Station. I mean, you're seeing some dramatic reconstructions, but these aren't the original runs. Honestly, I have no idea where they went, but messing around with over 40 hours of footage, 30 minutes are bound to disappear off somewhere. To run you through, counterfeit really wasn't too bad. I got it on my second try, as the snipers and turrets were easy enough to handle with the Anarchist build. And First World Bank and Murky Station were both completed stealthily, so honestly nothing really lost there. I'm sure you've seen millions of FWB clears in your time. Overall, it looked like we were in decent shape to tackle Deathwish, even without Jokers. My ICTV was holding out and making snipers less of a terrifying threat, whilst at least the Chimano was still pumping out decent damage. But as you know, with Jimmy's arrival, that means Boiling Point, the dreaded showstopper from last time. This heist is of course boat, meaning we may as well play it on Death Sentence, hence the horrible jump in difficulty. Not to mention, tasers are virtually snipers on this map and can pretty much one-shot my entire armor pool. I'm incredibly glad I didn't lose any Boiling Point footage, as it would have been tough to recreate. My first runs went about as well as you can imagine. This build was a little safer than the one we used on the last challenge, but simply couldn't handle dozers and shields well enough. It was time to again pray to the RNG gods and bring back the famed death cheese. Again, a 45% chance to self-revive, which feels closer to a 10% chance when you actually want it to go off. Oh sure, revive me three times on this heist where the game has decided I must live amongst the entire population of Russian dozers, but don't bother when I have a solid run going. Yeah, I shouldn't complain too much. This time around, it was only about two hours before luck turned in my favour. I had a decent bomb placement, low indoor spawns for once, and just a single dozer at the entrance, which was about the most I could handle. With no turrets, I was able to scan one super soldier, grab the server, and make a break for it. Patients went out against these two dozers, who never seem to approach if you slow play it, and this time around, I wasn't at the sniper's mercy. I could actually shoot back. Not very accurately, but at least in their general direction. Over the final ridge where I died at the end of the last challenge run, I managed to actually forge a path for myself and got the incredibly fortunate revive chance, which was all I needed. This was one of the most intense moments in Payday 2 for me. Actually dealing with the snipers was such a nightmare, but with that one instance of amazing luck and my Amcar finally deciding to cooperate, I clipped the head of the final sniper and made it clear. What a feeling. Last time, my celebrations were sort of muted because this heist clearly bugged. But this time around, Boiling Point, which is clearly one of the hardest heists in the format, was completed without any divine assistance. Sadly, my struggles here were a sign of things to come. Whereas the melee build thrived in a close quarters heist like Santa's Workshop, 
I needed more space with the ICT the Anarchist setup, making this another challenging hurdle. I was bulldozed in the rear once, rushed by a tan squad in another attempt, but made it through on the third by stretching the map out a little more and actually allowing the cops to bring the coke bags over to me. Up next was the much needed intermission of Car Shop. Sadly this break from the intensity only lasted about 6 minutes. Car Shop's a lot easier when you can actually shoot your guns, duly noted. And now, it was biker heist time. Another nemesis of mine, but surely it would be far easier with me actually having the range to properly cover the mechanic. Here is when I started to realise how much of a luxury fast dozer kills really were. If you don't have that in your build, everything is so much more dangerous as they distract that much more of your time. At this stage, I decided to turn my Shimano pink and put some cats on there because it deserved a new lick of paint after carrying the Amcar's sorry ass for 20 hours of gameplay. By this point in my build, the biker heist had no right being so difficult. In fact, on my very first run, I actually made it all the way to the bike escape stage in the worst mechanic location, admittedly with quite a few lucky revives along the way. But, trying to be patient and wait for a good escape timing, I ended up being dozer rushed and just didn't have the armor gate in me to stay alive. Future attempts were not half as successful as this one, with the mechanic escort objective being a consistent nightmare if the RNG gods decided to curse me with it. It never felt impossible in general, but I did run into certain situations on this heist that felt unplayable or impossible to survive in that instant. I didn't want to live life at the mercy of payday RNG any longer, so decided it was time for partners in crime. Jokers were in the building. I was enjoying the game without them up until this point, but seriously needed the extra armor they offer Anarchist, so picked up just the one, less as a distraction, more for those stat boosts. My new converts did have an immediate impact, and I was getting noticeably further with greater consistency, but the Jokers alone wouldn't be enough to get me through. I quickly tried a standard suit Anarchist build, but it was simply too exposed to the snipers later in the heist to be viable here. That in mind, it was the in heist strategy that needed to change, rather than the skill set. Yes, DPS was an issue, but survivability was an even greater one, so I'd need a better approach to the escort objective. Instead of trying to hold my ground and defend the mechanic, I actually fled the scene to bait cops toward me, before flanking round to clear the garage whenever he was interrupted. This got me through the worst of the objectives, and with a bit of caution with the final seat collection, escape was finally in sight. This time I could actually thin the sniper herd before grabbing the bike. Just for reference, in a prior run my escape was blocked by a lovely invisible wall you see here. So, not undercutting the corner, I made it out of the line of sight and completed day 1 of the biker heist, another massive landmark for this run. Day 2 is a fantastic mess that I don't mind running multiple times because it's so brief. That is unless I have to run it again because I forget to pick up the BCI helmet. Yep, this was my very first attempt, making it all the way back with nothing to show. You can actually see me attempt to throw the bag into the chopper here. Kicking myself, but undeterred, I ran it back only to be cut down less than 100 meters away on the return journey. What a gamer! As you can see, the biker boss is a bit of a bullet sponge for us with this build, but several attempts later I finally made it back in reasonable time, with the BCI actually on my shoulder this time around. And that does it for the biker heist. With that, you should know what time it is. Panic room, my old nemesis. Finally I could give those snipers a piece of my mind. However, in and of itself, this is actually just a tough heist. I initially dropped my convert skills for more damage with trigger happy, but after being shot to pieces on the roof, I decided to bring one along on all future heists. Later on I'll leverage their alluring distraction properties to great effect. As for Panic Room, I was even being embarrassed by the same guys I was meant to be having my redemption arc on. Here you can witness a sniper using his final smash on me by duplicating himself and shooting me simultaneously. Really rough stuff as my dream of revenge started to turn into a bit of a nightmare. At one point it actually got so bad that I decided to lean on the dreadful stoic 2 of 9 idea I tried last run. Don't get me wrong, it's a fine way to run the deck, but in this format it's basically a death sentence as I soon found out. Anyway, I returned to the old ICTV Anarchist for yet another run. During this one I actually got a call from my girlfriend before carrying on with the heist. You can actually see me pause the game and the recording. Well, let me tell you what a heist this was. Clutch plays left, right and centre, snipers screaming in agony as my true revenge was finally wrought. 
Yeah, this is gameplay from the failed runs. I forgot to turn the recording back on. I actually noticed the recording light wasn't on right as I entered the sewers, so at least you can see me earning all the achievements. <sighs> you guys aren't going to believe me, are you? Trust me, it was epic. There was no way, however, I was going to be playing through this 28-minute nemesis of mine again for this video. You'll see me kick its ass again on a future challenge run, I'm sure of it. Moving forwards, Panic Room was going to be the least of my worries. Coming up was Brooklyn 1010, another probable run killer for the no shooting run, but one that this build should be able to deal with. And believe it or not, it did, at first time of asking actually. There were some really tight moments, I did have a self revive proc, and the second building clear did require a pretty liberal use of my flashbangs to make it through. But the Endless Assault was actually quite kind in giving me the space to move the police cars and escape, despite a last minute rush on my position. The second Continental Heist is the Yacht Heist, a really fun stealth mission which I made relatively short work of, with my full stealth build in action at this point. Which brings us on to Undercover. I was worried about the classics, I have to admit, but I think this was genuinely my favourite heist of the run. The objectives are ideal for single player, and the heist design lends itself well to clever flanks, which require full use of the breadth of the playing space. Even the snipers on this map are well placed to force you into watching your positioning, and actually encourage a proper use of the preparation time to make sure that every board you can find is used well. That didn't mean there wasn't some RNG frustration though. After my first promising run was dozed to death, yet again, I realised that where Alex chose to drop the taxman made a huge difference to the difficulty here. The rooftop drop was a coverless nightmare, especially when he decides to take the long way around the roof. My third attempt, however, went perfectly. The car was dropped on the balcony, which is the ideal location, as you can fix the drill from cover, and the hacking room was located in the basement, which is also perfect for how I like to play the map. At this stage, I was pretty much leaning on the Chimano to carry me, which it did a decent job of here, making it through the heist in just over 20 intense minutes. I really felt like I was in that weird trench of difficulty where Deathwish is just slightly too hard with these weapons, but Mayhem is far too easy, and this became all the more apparent when I headed to the slaughterhouse. This was quite an inconspicuous heist for me, I'd not had it down as a brick wall for this run. But for future runs, this heist is going to be a notable killer, simply because it's poorly designed for a single player to complete. The bag moving is the primary issue. Yeah, the conveyors exist and are of genuine assistance to solo players, but gold is just such a heavy loot type, and cop spawns on this heist can be unpredictable and even unfair at times. I've been shot by cops crawling through doors more times than I care to remember. Through dozens of slaughterhouse runs, I was consistently able to move into the loading bay and hide my gold, but if I tried to move all 8 bags at once, I was consistently thwarted by cops stealing it back, and the trip from the slaughterhouse itself to the container was a living nightmare after depositing the first bag. Run after run was ended by flanking dozers, a myriad of 5 snipers that spawned far too frequently for my liking, and even a SWAT van turret that could randomly spawn and presented an immovable object with the low DPS of this build. I started moving the bags two at a time and taking things real slow, but the longer I dragged things out, the likelier I was to be dozed out of the blue, especially with the minigun dozers standing in my way on this difficulty. After over 30 failed runs, admittedly slightly distracted by the France Switzerland game on my other monitor, I actually made it to the escape portion of the map. Bear in mind this took over 30 minutes from high start. Now it was just a waiting game, but with as much cover as the loading area provides, there's always some spawn that can catch you out and some sniper that can end the run in an instant. Short of hiding in a container, which would have been a death trap with my low DPS, I simply had to take out spawning cops faster than they could kill me. This fight or die style of play suits Anarchist perfectly and was seriously fun, but it was also unsustainable. After almost 40 minutes it was simply too much, I was overwhelmed and I really regret not making a break for it, but the gauntlet of snipers, shields and dozers at the end of this heist was just as likely to kill me as any other stage even if I had. It was undoubtedly time to call on one of my lifelines. 
Just as an aside, I don't think this heist is as impossible as Panic Room was to the last run. It's just at this level of difficulty, pretty much irrespective of the rules of the run, Slaughterhouse can halt progress no matter what I do. So having a contingency I think spices things up, especially if you want to see what those later heists have to offer. Also, if I'd maxed Stoic from the start, I'm almost positive I could have made it easily, given how far I was able to get with just half the deck available. Anyway, the phone a friend or bring along some crew AI members suited this one perfectly. Extra bodies would be ideal for moving the gold in just two runs, and chance of revives would make the escape portion of this heist a little more forgiving. To keep things as fair as I could, I forced the AI to bring along copies of my Amcar to suffer with me. Oh, when at some point I decided to name them Hit and Miss, but ironically the one called Hit was the one that couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. In any case, this lifeline worked perfectly. I have to say, Team AI may not play into the rules of these challenges, but as they increased the cop spawn rates, in many ways this heist was just as hard as it was before. It still had that same intensity, but saved me from making 8 separate trips across the perilous courtyard. As I'd anticipated, the escape was dangerous, going down multiple times and only making it through thanks to a bit of luck, heavy armour and my invincible crewmates saving the day. Almost 550 kills by the way, that's the real reason they call it the slaughterhouse. As I said, I want feedback on these new lifeline rules, do you feel like you were cheated out of my suffering, or happy that the run's able to proceed into the later stages? Let me know. I'd already spent 5 hours on this heist though, so I'm not sure how much time I would have been willing to sink into it without this rule. As I'm playing with this rule for now, it means we move on to Lock's Arrival. Beneath the Mountain is up first. I wasn't sure what to expect from this one. I knew I could handle the entrance, and the hacks didn't seem like they'd be too difficult with the reduced spawns of single player. But the exposed courtyard section was the main worry, especially as it takes 2 trips as a solo player. This was pretty much how it played out, making it up and out of the bunker without having too many problems, but then having to fight tooth and nail to stay alive once out there. It's a good job snipers spawn one at a time, but the shield army did cause some of their own issues. They hit incredibly hard over range on Deathwish. Flashbangs were my saviour though, and I got the chopper spawn which is easiest to hold in my opinion, making it through the heist on my first run, success which felt alien after the suffering of Slaughterhouse. But don't you worry more suffering was on the way. Birth of Sky is a fun heist for the first 6 minutes. The skydive is easy, the first couple of pallets, no problem. But after that, this one seriously escalates. Snipers spawn on both sides of the map simultaneously, leading to more issues in taking them out, and SWAT van turrets pin you down and limit mobility. Not to mention, if you make it to the escape, as I actually did on my very first run, the sewer escape has scripted dozer spawns, which for weapons like these, feel unkillable. At least that is before they kill me, which is the case in this particular example. This scaling difficulty led to multiple lengthy but equally fruitless runs. Even as I started to go for the broken and more exposed pallets earlier, the escape still presented a wall I didn't really know how to break through. This was recorded the same day as the slaughterhouse section for context, and I really think that had frayed my patience and led to me making a slight mistake here. After only an hour of trying, I decided to use my second and final lifeline to drop the difficulty down to mayhem for this heist. This was definitely hasty. My thinking was that a lower difficulty would make the escape more accessible, and I was right. This was just further proof that mayhem is way too easy at this stage of the run, yet Deathwish feels too hard. But I'm almost certain, with enough practice, this could have been done without the use of a lifeline, meaning I head into some of the hardest heists in the game with no more get out of jail free options. That shouldn't matter for now though, as it was Heat Street up next, a nice solo heist that doesn't have any bags or drills to really annoy me. As such, it was a first time completion without too much fuss, as the damage drop off on Deathwish makes it a far easier prospect than on DSOD. At this stage my build looks like this, with Frenzy and Berserker being dropped in favour of more damage and utility skills, especially with my Chimano, Miss, carrying the run. Green Bridge was never going to be easy, I was reliant on some decent RNG with the prisoner location, not bothering to drill the rear van on most runs. It was the prisoner exfiltration though that was the real issue. A mounted turret, sniper spawns and a seriously claustrophobic setting made this a nightmare, even after I drafted in a second joker. However, it was nothing like the challenges I'd faced the day before, so with a little good luck and caution, I made it through the scaffolding defence after several tries. 
the ensuing escape was easy enough, even as a heavily armoured snail. Time now for Locke's Betrayal. Alaskan Deal is one of my go-to warm-up or practice heists, and is really well designed if you want to tackle it as a solo player. That didn't stop at least one run being ended by a sniper I'd forgotten all about. Attempt 2 went even cleaner though, with my preferred tank spawn. And after clearing the deck, sort of, we fade to black and make it out. Diamond Heist is up next, not to be confused with The Diamond, or The Diamond Store, or any other diamond related heist. This one is easy enough to take on in stealth, making it a free completion and some extra XP before the home straight of Loud Nightmares. Speaking of, we have Reservoir Dogs, the final two day heist for which I decided to try a slightly different strategy, using suppressor skills to max out on accuracy and hopefully allow my AI jokers to draw more cop attention. This actually worked, but often just made it harder to shoot doses in the faceplate. It's not a bad idea though, and I'm sure I'll try using this optical illusion strat on future runs. Even with the extra distraction though, I managed to get sniped by a sniper so far away, I think he's comprised of about 3 pixels on my screen. Positioning was clearly key on this heist, and if I could stay on top of those sniper spawns, it was easy enough to break the shoddy pathing of the AI and keep them at arm's length. Such a strategy would sadly not be possible as we head into day 2. This heist is a mess. The ambush is standardised, irrespective of player number, so with these glorified nerf guns, I'm expected to take out 5 dozers over the first 4 minutes of the heist. Once through that chaos, things aren't nearly as difficult until the snipers start coming and an escape is on the cards. Run number 1 was ended as I panicked to stop my hard earned diamonds being straight lifted from the zipline. Run 2 was thwarted by some really cruel spawns after making it to the escape section. As they say though, third time's a charm, meaning I made it off the road without too many issues. One useful technique I learned was to kill any snipers that spawned on the side with the car, but any that didn't have a line of sight to it could be left alive to clog up their spawns. After LA, it was time for Brooklyn, and a bank heist that's never been too challenging given its short length. That doesn't mean it can't give me a few issues. The real peak of difficulty in this heist comes from moving the equipment from the dumps to spawn into the bank itself. Fortunately my second attempt saw me drag those winch parts across and break into the vault early on. After another painfully slow lockpicking interaction, Brooklyn Bank was in the bag along with the medallion of Perseids. Breaking feds was the nasty stealth challenge it usually is, with Garrett himself deciding to catch me in the act on attempt 1. Like I've said before though, these challenges have really improved my stealth skills, and just one run later on, I was into his safe and away with the elephant's coffer. Onto the home straight now, with just some gritty, short story heist left to go. Henry's Rock was next, one that I was sure I should have held on to my difficulty reducer for. Knowing it was going to be a tough one, I reassembled my build, this time with Messiah. There was no way I'd make it through a heist like Henry's Rock without going down at some point, so this guaranteed revive made perfect sense to me. And it seriously worked. I had some great armor gating moments on this heist, just about keeping myself afloat by standing my ground and dishing out damage. The archaeology room was easy enough, but the weapons room presented some issues. The cover is terrible in here, spawns are sporadic, and the AI are actually really good at interrupting the objectives for once, meaning I needed to be in two places at once. Admittedly, with a lot of assistance from the Revenant tree, I made it through to the escape sequence at first time of asking. I had the turrets just fine, but the holdout when waiting for Bile was painful. I didn't position myself well, pistol ammo started to run out, and at the crucial moment when I go down, I get flashbanged and I'm unable to make those necessary shots. So close to first timing this one, I 100% blame you, Amkar. I'm actually surprised though by how doable it was, so I head back in and this time make sure to play the waiting game a little more effectively inside the compound when I'm aiming to escape. I get gifted the perfect fade timing and make it out with just the one down this time around. In my head, that was mission complete. Henry's Rock was the last heist down on my This Is Trouble list, so it would surely be smooth sailing from here on in. Well, Shacklethorn wasn't going to throw a spanner in the works, despite me forgetting how one of the objectives functions, it really isn't a tough heist to sneak, especially compared to the madness of going loud. Hell's Island was not one I was particularly worried about from an objective standpoint, but the ambush section in particular on this heist does present some issues, especially as you need two lots of thermite to make it through. 
but I've struggled through this many times before and Death Wish just doesn't have that same spike in difficulty as Death Sentence does, making it past, freeing Bane and easily face tanking the turret with my ICTV. At the rooftops, this is where things get strange though. I always thought this section was heavily scripted and Locke will simply move Bane around when prompted to by the timer, but that doesn't seem to be the case at all, as you can see from this early attempt where I actually get timed out because Locke's so damn slow moving from location to location. I'm pretty sure this is because I didn't defend him actively when he rests beneath the castle walls, so on my next attempt I try to be a little more active, but still no luck. This of course couldn't be because I was hampered by slow interaction speed, so it had to be something else. On my next attempt, I was even more aggressive in clearing his path, and fortunately, it worked. I think this mechanic kinda sucks, it's never fun to be at the mercy of Payday 2 AI, but once he finally gets a move on and makes it to the chopper, even though we only have about 10 seconds to spare, we make it out cleanly enough. So much for Henry's Rock being the final test though, I was definitely panicking on this one. Before No Mercy, the penultimate heist of this run, I finally decided to retire the old ICTV and go back to Suits Anarchist, as Lord Almir intended. As I've said, this means better armor gating, which can be useful given the onslaught in the tight hospital corridors, and is possible as this heist has no extra snipers. One added bonus is that I can finally bring back the old crit plan, which was the aim when I first started this challenge, so hurrah for incredible planning. Finally, the Amcar had the stopping power to warrant usage again, which was shocking. This was pretty key for dispatching dozers in this up close and personal heist. I love No Mercy at this point, and although my first run was thwarted by my own itchy trigger finger preventing a Messiah revive, it's just a pleasure to see these god awful weapons dishing out some damage now I'm level 98 and have every skill I could possibly need. Run 2 was much cleaner, and despite finding the correct patient on the last drill, it was still an easy enough holdout. Not to mention, the game decided to throw positive blood samples at me like it was nothing during the final section of the heist. A 25 minute run, but one I thoroughly enjoyed as a send off to hit and miss. The best, worst weapons a heister could ever ask for. As tempting as it was to take them out for one last loud spin on the White House, this is still a challenge run and I think completing heists in the most effective way possible is really in the spirit of it. Stealth had to be the way to go. After one sticky situation around the Oval Office, I made it into the Peoc, grabbed the pardons, and escaped with my newfound freedom from a life of crime and these terrible weapons. So within this rule set, you absolutely can beat Payday 2 with only the Amcar and the Chimano 88. Shame the dentist is gonna rule the world or whatever it is he has planned. Future runs may include a completion of the secret if we get this far, but for this one I just wanted to get that here's to another heist message and the satisfaction of, oh yeah, huh, bollocks. As ever guys, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch a monumentally long video such as this one. As you know they take an age to put together, but your incredible response to that first one makes it all worthwhile. I really enjoy making these challenge videos and have found the gameplay to be so refreshingly fun. It's actually been improving my aim and game sense believe it or not, so it's worth a try if you're a little fed up with Payday of late. As for this run, I really think Stoic would have been a superior move from the start. I avoided it in favour of Crit, which I just ended up not using anyway, so that would have been the one thing I'd change. As for the rules and lifelines, I think they work well, but would like to hear your opinion on them overall. It's all subject to change as we perfect the general challenge run rule set. Of course, leave your ideas for future challenges down below, some brilliant ideas posted on the last one that I can't wait to try out. Once more, have a great day, good luck on your heisting endeavours, and remember, you miss 100% of the shots, you fire with hit. That's a saying, isn't it? That's how it goes. As ever, thank you very much to my mean infamy patrons and above. If you want to join that infamous club to see yourself in the credits or get early exclusive access to my videos, including the story videos, check out my Patreon link below. Remember the Discord is open to all if you crave some more payday discussion. Thank you very much for watching this video, and I'll see you all very soon for the next one.